Uh, and I feel so bad. I wish that, I wish that would have worked. Um, anyway, back to, back to the slides. So the video is a great um, description, animation, in very simple terms of what molecular profiling is and why it's so important. And I will definitely get these videos to you um, as soon as possible, as soon as we're done here. Um, it came about because um, obviously cholangiocarcinoma is a global problem. And we all know that 85% of adult cancer patients are seen outside of a major cancer center where they can um, receive you know, a multidisciplinary team and have the testing done and access to clinical trial options. So our, our goal was to target community oncology settings. Um, we did a survey prior to this initiative um, of 132 of our patients and we asked them if they had ever had genomic profiling done. 52% said no, 48% said yes. Out of the 52% that said no, 61% didn't know about genomic profiling. And out of the 48% that said yes, they said that having their profiling done influenced their treatment decisions. So at least 50% of cholangiocarcinoma patients have mutations that are currently available um, with treatments that they, we could potentially target. So one thing we've got going for this disease is we do have a high volume of targetable mutations. Only 5% of adult cancer patients participate in a clinical trial. So a small number of participants, we wanted to see how we could increase that number. Um, as for me, I'm here 11 years later because of a clinical trial that this is my family, um, all six of my children. And um, my clinical trial wasn't necessarily because of the mutation. It was more about my immune system, but my immune system was reactive to one of my mutations. So the profiling was done on my tumor. Matt is um, a patient of cholangiocarcinoma and he had the genomic profiling done in the beginning of his diagnosis and kind of held on to it, didn't really know what to do with it. But fortunately, um, his provider recognized that the MLH1 mutation was um, related to the mismatch repair deficiency and chose to start him on Keytruda um, off-label. And Matt considers himself cured today. Today, you know, as of today, he has no evidence of disease, but he would have never had that option if someone hadn't looked at his profiling report. Oops, sorry. Um, Kate is a young patient that we had. She was actually diagnosed um, at 28 years old. And unfortunately, she passed away last September, but she um, survived this disease for four years, which is quite remarkable. Um, and she was probably able to have a couple extra years because of getting her profiling done and entering into clinical trials that targeted those mutations. So our objective was to educate the community oncologists and patients about genomic profiling to increase clinical trial participation. Um, our specific goals were to increase our outreach and education about genomic profiling and clinical trials, and then make sure we did it in a targeted and measurable way. Uh, this is one of Stacey Lindsay's, our president and um, CEO's uh, favorite quotes. If you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, go together. So this was the team that um, made up, there's several different parts of this initiative. So this was the team that we put together to accomplish this initiative. Um, the Kalanji Carcinoma Foundation, um, we provided the patients, the resources to the patients. Um, we were able to facilitate common goals and objectives, convene all the parties, and then we're going to track our metrics. The PR experts were Ion Communications, and they came up with a strategic communications plan, uh, PR plan, to be able to reach um, media and get this information out there. Komodo Health is a health data company, and they helped provide us with um, the emails of the community oncologists, so they're able to tell us where our patients are being diagnosed, in what setting, and then the referral rate of, um, if, if a community oncologist is referring to a, a larger um, cancer center. DMD Communications, they um, provided us with a targeted email campaign, both to healthcare providers, um, uh, to nurses, to uh, mid-level practitioners, um, so that we were targeting all the right people, hopefully. And then D2 Creative is the company which um, created these animations. They call them illuminations. They partner with Mill Pond Communications. Um, they put the visual content 
And they say by adding humor and metaphors, it makes learning sticky. And that's why these um, illuminations seem to be so popular. We did make these videos available in um, five other languages besides English as well. Um, Prothera partnered with us to be a patient concierge service to help patients get their um, testing um, done. They facilitated, facilitated the process between the patient and the provider. And that comprised of our team. So a special blueprint for outreach was outreach and education, um, make sure genomic profiling is being done, uh, increase the clinical trial participation, which um, provides more research, which equals a better quality of life and longer life expectancy. And then the roots of all that were all the partners in this uh, process. And in a one year time frame, we wanted to do monthly reviews of all the metrics and make adjustments where necessary. And I wanna say these statistics were about six months into our process where um, the Mutations Matter um, page was viewed more than 4,250 times and then users spent about two minutes and 53 uh, seconds on the patient page and three minutes and 10 seconds on the provider's page. And of those that visited the sub page, 72% went to the patient page and 28% went to the provider page. And then this is our latest video because of the, and some of you may have been involved in it, because of the initiative of the common testing terminology um, with a bunch of other non or, um, nonprofit groups. Stacy was involved in this and um, so she wanted to do a new video since biomarkers seem to be the term that everyone um, came to agreement upon to use for molecular profiling, genomic profiling and all those. So we redid the video and described the biomarkers and I'm bummed that I can't show that to you, but I'm gonna get can, off can here and share start, it to you. Can you start to play it just so people can kind of get a, the image of? Absolutely. Um, yeah. So just so you guys can see it, it's, it's cartoonish and, and it's super, super, super consumable. Um, and I didn't realize that you had, re, um, that you had reworked it. And, and the biomarkers comment, for those of you who were on the presentation that Jill gave, um, this is the movement to uh, standardize the terminology um, so that patients and clinicians are, are both you know, kind of on the same page about what, what needs to be tested, what needs to be looked for, so. Yes, um, yeah, I apologize so much. I wished I was not technologically challenged, but I am. Uh, no, this is fantastic. Um, and I will email those out right away. I mean, they, you can view them on um, uh, kalangiocarcinoma.org on the website, the Mutations Matter work, or actually just go to um, www.biomarkers.org and it'll take you to the most current um, version of the um, illumination. And I have to say a little bit about the illumination process. So I don't know if any of you guys ever uh, worked with or met uh, Pat Gavin. He is, um, he was a cancer advocate, um, very involved in the advocacy space. I met him at one of the um, I think NCI patient advocate steering committee meetings and um, he was on one of those committees. He's very much involved in the um, advocacy world. But he and um, a friend of his from Mill Pond Communications who started these illuminations, they wanted to make these um, illuminations animations for, for cancer patients so that they could take um, complicated, you know, um, definitions and um, questions and, and put them into a, a digestible format. And so um, they were going to create what they called cancer answers. And so they've done um, several of these illuminations. There's some on Stand Up to Cancer um, website. All of them on our, are on our website as well about how to describe um, clinical trials, um, how to understand results of clinical trials. One of our industry partners just did that. There's a three-part series talking about RESIS criteria and different things like that. And there's all sorts of really good videos, um, animations out there to describe really hard um, subjects, I guess. But um, Pat passed away, but they carried on in his name. So a lot of the characters in there, not a lot of them, but one of the characters is actually uh, Pat Gavin. And you can see him in some of them. And if you knew who he was, you would be able to recognize it. So that, um, it just warms my heart that they were able to take these in and make these happen because of that. Um, they're great, great resources, but we're 
now being able to get industry to do some. We just had another industry partner um, finish. We haven't seen them yet. We haven't um, uh, put them out yet, but they just finished one describing like the FGFR mutation, which is a, a mutation that is um, prevalent in about 14% of our cancer patients. So they, they described that. So we're excited to get that launched too. But feel free. The point of creating these, um, Bear was our sponsor for the first one. We won um, a grant. Um, we went and competed with some other advocacy organizations for a grant, and they were so impressed with our presentation that they gave us twenty-five thousand extra dollars to make it agnostic, uh, an agnostic version. So we've continued to do that throughout um, all of our animations as we're creating. Make sure that they're tumor agnostic so that we can share them across the board. So feel free to use these videos wherever and however you want. There is a tumor agnostic version on the website. We're happy to share. Thank you, Melinda. And, and I just, those of you who have been on multiple versions of these calls know that um, Melinda and specifically these videos are, are one of the reasons that, you know, when, when Manju and Alice and I first started talking about kind of creating a group like this, um, it, it's things like this that I get so excited about because a lot of us, you know, we spend time, we spend effort, we spend resources creating materials for our community when in reality, a lot of what we create and brand, and I'll speak for breast cancer specifically, could be available and could be useful um, to, to other organizations. And so this to me is just like the epitome of advocacy working on the, on behalf of, of of all, all cancer um, patients, survivors, survivors, researchers, you know, name it. So um, anybody have any questions for Melinda? Thank you, Melinda. Oh, you're so welcome. Happy. That was fantastic. Um, now, did you say it's biomarkers.org? Biomarkersmatter.org. Okay. I put it in the chat there. And there's also mutationsmatter.org. Org.org. You can get to both of them. Is that, that a hashtag that you use on like Twitter or anything? Yes. We use it a lot. It started out mutations matter, but then when we, you know, when the terminology was changed, we decided we better switch it up. And, and so the, the, the new video with biomarkers matter is completely different, but describes the same thing, but it talks about like all the biomarkers, the um, diagnostic, um, I don't know, prognostic, what are the other ones that I'm thinking of the right words, but it talks about all of them and explains it. And so I think it's a little more in depth than the mutations matter where it's just talking about um, getting your molecular profiling done. I think they're both um, very much uh, worth using. I still share them both every time I, I send both of them to all the patients I communicate with. And I get such good feedback because they can really understand it instead of sending the the science publication out that it describes, you know, profiling, this is so much easier. So now I send them both. No, I, just because you mentioned that somebody was doing immunotherapy with Keytruda and stuff, is PDL1 shown as a biomarker, even though it's not like a genomic, it's kind of, it, but it's more it's, of a biomarker. <laughs> right. I wouldn't, yeah, I wouldn't say that, but I'm glad that most, most places I think test for it. So I think that it, I mean, it's a protein, right? It's not a mutation. Yeah. And, and, and when I'm in the lung cancer space and when they refer to comprehensive biomarker testing, that's kind of the implication that it's considered a biomarker, even though it's not like a mutation or genomic. Right. And so, right. you know, to keep it dumbed down, I guess. I want to say that pd one might be mentioned in there, but I'm, I think they stuck to MSI high in, in tumor mutational burden, if I remember right. You think I would know from watching it so much, but... No, you probably just stopped listening. <laughs> well, pd one was really important for me um, as well, because three years after my um, last cell treatment, um, they started growing again and I had the presence of the pd one protein. So then I used Keytruda as well, which opened the window up for my mutation reactive T cells to see the cancer again. So it was important for me to get the testing each time, you know, to find out because um, yeah, it just was, but. Now, are you doing anything as far as the follow-up is um, like that they're doing with like the liquid biopsy or any of that sort of stuff without seeing the video? I mean, <laughs> maybe by watching the video, I'll answer all my questions. <laughs> No, I mean, yes, we're constantly, our next project is, that we're working on is um, a, an animation to help patients understand their results. 
because that is always an issue for, you know, for all of our patients. I can't tell you how many times a day someone sends me their report and says, help. And so we're, and we know that there's several different reports from several different companies, but we just want to try to break it down to the basics so patients have a better understanding of what it means and maybe what to look for so they can have a better discussion with their doctor. Oh yeah, I, I'm, I'm with KRAS Kickers. And so that's exactly what, you know, the bulk of life is about is biomarkers. Yes, yes. And while it's important, I mean, like I said, 50% of our patients have them, but there's still 50% of our patients that don't. So we still have to, you know, continue the work the other way too. They don't yet. I always want to say that it's never not imperative or important to have those results because just because it's not, um, there's not something that's uh, targeted towards it today, we don't know what tomorrow's bringing. And so it's still important. So I know that, that when um, we talked about the presentation for me, it was, it was around this, right? It was around this resource that you guys have created. Um, but when you presented, you, you actually talked about how it fit into the bigger picture of, of um, this you know, kind of complex initiative that you'd put together. And I, I'm familiar with it, but I, I, I wanna make sure other people understand that this was part of an effort to um, get not only people to understand what biomarker testing was, but to get them to be able to access it and then to be able to see where they could fit in, not only from a clinical treatment perspective, but from also a research perspective. So this was really a huge multi-prong Effort. Yeah. And Melinda, I don't know if you, you want to take a moment to just kind of explain the width and breadth of it a little. Um, definitely. So we were seeing from our patients, which I think most, um, I think it's pan cancer that has this issue is, you know, patients who are getting diagnosed in a community setting were being told, um, no, not yet. You know, we don't need to do this testing yet. It's, it's not time. Wait till you fail this. And, and we're trying to tell them, no, we need to do it now, especially especially right now when there's a lot of first line clinical trials going on um, in our disease area where they need to get the testing immediately. And so it was an initiative to make sure that the physicians knew to make sure that when they're having their biopsy to get enough for a good sample so this could be sent off for testing right away. And then it also opened the doors for all these clinical trials. Um, when MATCH was being done at NCI, um, our patients, swarm to that because of this, and this is before the video, but because of the vol high volume of targetable mutations, about 20% of the patients in the MATCH trial um, were cholangiocarcinoma patients, the bile duct cancer patients, like they were matched to all those different areas. So we knew how important it was to get this information out, not only to our disease, but to other diseases. And so it provided the options, not only for the patients to know about it, but for the providers, especially in the community setting to know about it, which increased the clinical trial participation. We um, had our first drug approval in cholangiocarcinoma this year, which is super exciting, but yet it's still, and we still have a long ways to go. I mean, uh, an FGFR2 um, drug was uh, approved, pemigatinib, which is absolutely outstanding, but that's only 14% of our of our patients, so we still have you know a long ways to go. And um, I think um, what you're what you were referring to, Stacey, was just the the ability of, of patients to be able to enter into clinical trials faster and further the research faster. It's been great. It's been it's, it's a good it's a good it's been a good initiative. It's um, been we've been able to share it with others, which is which is so important. I think to be able to do that. And then um, to see the results from it um, has been really beneficial too. Super excited. Anybody have any more questions for Melinda before I monopolize all of her time with questions? And like uh, I said. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll chime in that the Pancreatic Cancer Action Network has a program called Know Your Tumor. Mm -hmm. and, uh, one of the benefactors who's since passed away left a lot of money which allows for free testing. So uh, myself as a mentor, it's one of the first things that I say to patients is you need to get your uh, tumor tested or have a liquid biopsy. Uh, and I'm living proof of having a liquid biopsy and finding out that I was BRCA2 positive, getting into an early clinical trial and eight years and four months later with stage four pancreatic cancer, here I am. Yay. 
except for um, uh, having a bout of anemia right now, and I'm down to 8.5, and I'm really mm -hmm. feeling it. So I have to go in for a uh, bone marrow aspirin. And it could have been from the PARP1 inhibitor that I've been on, full dose for the last six years. So uh, I, I just stopped that a couple days ago, wait to see if things bounce back or go to a plan B. Otherwise, I feel great. Good, good. Awesome. Thanks for sharing. And there are people on this call who have dealt with anemia, so <laughs> I'm not calling anybody out. Um, so to, to Stephen's point, if, if you guys are interested, the Know Your Tumor program actually also used Prothera. So you saw Melinda, one of the partners um, in, that, in that program was Prothera. And there are other, there are other providers, there are other, you know, reports, there are other, and that actually leads me to my next question, Melinda, because I think a lot of us um, are really interested in how you start to approach um, creating a program like that. Like what, what was the, you know, do you, do you co-design it with these partners? Do you kind of come and say, this is what we need and then, you know, appeal to them? How does, how has that worked for, for CCF or? Yeah, so it was a big brainstorming session of finding out where, you know, what the, where the barriers were, what we were struggling with, and just looking at all, um, all the information that we had. And we had partnered with Komodo, and they had all this information, and we knew that we could have access, you know, to the information we needed. And then we're like, okay, what do we do with it? And, you know, how do we, how do we bring that in to make it part of, something that's that's important and so that was helpful we had just formed a partnership with them when when this happened so that i think was just good timing on our part but proved to be very beneficial um dmd was the targeted email campaign and they were actually introduced to us by d2 creative who created the video and you know we knew we needed to have some direct form of campaign to be able to get out to these we had the we had the resources of, of where to send the emails, but now we need, needed to know how do we get them to open them and read them and, and make it um, relative and important for them. And so they came up with a, a, a plan of, um, we had a six, every six, every month for six months, we did a targeted email and, and then they provided us with the results of who opened them, how long they looked, all that stuff. So, so that was very helpful to know, to know when to send them, what day of the week, what time of the week, all of that came into play. Um, Iron Communications happens to be, um, their son had cholangiocarcinoma and so they wanted to get um, on board and help, you know, with PR and get the, the, the news out because um, they, they saw the importance in it. And I'm trying to think of who else was in there, but I mean, the biggest thing happened is we actually put the plan together before we went to, to bear, right? So we had to formulate how we were going to do this. We wanted to do the video. We absolutely wanted to do the video. And when the bear um, grant came out, uh, it, it just all fell into place because we had already been struggling with these issues. And so we put it together and we were super excited. It was, um, I can't think of what it is called. They, they call it something. The shark, um, the shark, it was kind of like a shark tank competition. And, you know, we went and presented our, our pitch to them. And um, it was right after ASCO, like, you know, the, the last day of ASCO, we went and, and did the pitch. And I've never been so nervous in all my life. And we were so excited to win. It was, it was so exciting. What was because the total, I know you mentioned that they, that they funded additionally to, to do a, an agnostic version, but what was the total of, of, of cost? What does a program like that cost to put on? So the grant was 100000 and they added an additional 25000 to that grant for us, as long as we um, would make a tumor agnostic version, which we were more than happy to do. And so I just, I, I'm loving it because I think we hear, you know, as advocates, we hear how expensive um, trials are to put on, right? And then the majority of trials don't ever accrue to, you know, to, to actually get off the ground. And, and when you think about, you know, the cost of a trial and the cost of that campaign, how might we start to build something like that, maybe not as robust, but something like that into some of these trials and, and therefore make them more, um, you know, more, more successful, at least from a, from a recruitment standpoint. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, they were expensive. These animations, our illuminations, as they call them, are, they can be expensive. I want to say they're 30 some thousand dollars, um, depending on the length and, and all that. Once we created these characters, um, 
we can you know continue to use the same characters and um, and, and different things. So the more videos we do or um, have coming down the line, the, the less expensive it will be. But once we got that initial um, video done and put it out there, then I think some of our industry partners really realized how beneficial it was and how much it would relate to um, patients and and providers and and it was a good form and and so now like I said we've had two other industry companies who have put together several um, illuminations um, and then we are also working with like the testing companies now to do that how to how to how to read your results and they're they're helping to fund those so I think you just have to be creative and looking for funding <laughs> and put putting the ideas out there but I've learned now you know don't be afraid to ask it never hurts to ask and and to get their their pitch on it I remember in the beginning when I first started because cholangiocarcinoma has never really had a lot of industry involvement until recently and now we do and because of this high volume of uh, targetable mutations but in the beginning, it was we were so scared. We didn't want to ever ask for too much. And now I'm like, that was silly. I mean, we should totally ask, right? <laughs> we were definitely very young and naive. <laughs> Melinda, did they want something back for what um, you know for the for the for the grant? Yes, we did have to report back on the metrics, and um, they did. Um, they were impressed enough with the metrics that they did put the funding towards the new video biomarkers yeah. matter as well. And so, yeah, we did, we definitely had to report back on the metrics and, and, the, and they were happy with that. I'm trying to read the question. That's great because it didn't, it sounds like it wasn't, uh, okay, now that we're funding you, we want you to do testimonials for us or for our drugs, or it was really a partnership. It, and it really was. Um, they have the the Entrec, uh, mutation, and um, very few of our patients have it, but there are there are some. So it wasn't. I'm not going to say it wasn't relevant, but it wasn't super relevant, you know, to our our population. And they were really good about that. They that's, great. And that's what they said. As long as it was agnostic, they were a great partner to work with because of that. In fact, they were very specific about um, not putting bear in the video you know we did a little segment at the end you know generously sponsored by Barrett. that was it that's all they wanted so that was i thought very generous very yeah. nice and what um department of bear was runs that do you, do you know like who is it patient advocacy or patient engagement or just somebody philanthropic <laughs> yeah no so it was patient advocacy um it, and and they do this grant i want to say they've they did it every year. Um, the patient advocacy representative is no longer there. She is at a different company. So I don't know how to make the connection other than um, Jane Perlmutter. She was the mm. judge, one of the patient advocate judges for us. And I know she had done it several years. Okay. And um, Wendy Selig was on there because her team, I think, had won the grant the year before. And so it was a it was a yearly grant that they did. And it, it was like a shark tank. That's what we called it, a shark tank thing where um, the advocacy groups would come pitch their idea. And then uh, I think there was 30 applications. They narrowed it down to five and then the top three got grants. That's great. Yeah. And that year it was us, um, NCCS and uh, Danielle Leach uh, with her, the pediatric group that she works for uh, oh. were, the, were the winners. Yeah. Yeah, so it was it was stiff competition. <laughs> Definitely was, but it was all good. And it makes you better, I'm sure, for the future because you learn so much putting it together and and really having to craft a good pitch. Oh, absolutely, and and they took it serious um, because they gave each finalist a mentor from previous years to okay. work with them to really you know to get their pitch together and and and. I don't know if they're still doing it. Obviously, we didn't have ASCO last year, but um, but it was such a great program. It was such a great opportunity. And it was one of those things. I just felt like it was we were in the right place at the right time because we uh, stumbled upon the grant because we really hadn't been working um, closely with Bear on anything else. And I was like, well, what the heck? Let's give it a try. And we, you know, that's why I say it never hurts to ask ever. Yeah. yeah. 
So Melinda, you mentioned trying to read the questions and I just, I was like, oh, yeah. we've got questions. Um, <laughs> Um, John was asking about um, if, and, and we, you and I have talked a, a, a good deal about this, um, are other nonprofits kind of resistant to taking, I mean, you've created something that everybody can use, but are they resistant to using them because they're not theirs, they haven't? I don't think so. I, I mean, I haven't felt any pushback at all. Um, you'll have to go view the tumor agnostic one because it's, it's totally um, usable for for all cancer types. So I've never, I've never heard any pushback or any, um, I'm trying to think of people who have used it, but several have. I, I've seen it. I've gone to conferences sometimes and somebody will be using it and I'll be like, yes, yes, I, I'm you know, so excited. So um, can't give you a specific name off the top of my head, but I know that it's been, being shared, so. I think the big, the big takeaway here, actually, John, is that it can be shared. I think there's a lot of nonprofit groups that don't realize that it exists. Um, and so one of the things, you know, I, I figure that our group can do, you know, as advocates is, is make people aware of it. Um, and if people have the dollars to reinvent, yay for them. Um, but, but most nonprofits are definitely in a situation where the, the, the dollars are few and far between. So, yeah. yes. And, and, on, and on that one, yeah, Dana, I, I look at that and I go, oh, Dana and I are happy to share it to, to the content. Yeah, uh, or, oh, even later, or even later today. Um, please do, please do, on. nothing would make us happier. Spot on, and thank you. Yeah, and that's just it. I mean, and that's one good thing. Um, well, many of the good things about Stacy Lindsay, my, um, the founder and uh, CEO of the Clinch Carcinoma Foundation, I mean, she's constantly saying collaboration is key for everyone and why reinvent the wheel? We, we're all here, you know, doing, good work so why not share where you can share the resources if, where you can so I mean PanCan has been amazing with us they share their resources and um, all the time and we want to be able to do the same yeah and um, Stephen put in the link to the know your tumor program if, if you guys weren't aware of it um, you know go go ahead and, and take a look they also have a lot of you know educational materials to kind of support um, people as they try and figure out, you know, when, when I think many of us are still seeing on a daily basis when people say, well, biomarker testing is now the language that we're moving towards. But part of the rationale for that is because people do get confused with what is, what is genetic testing? What is genomic testing? What is germline? What is somatic? I mean, there's so many things out there that if you just come in from, you know, not a science background with a diagnosis, and pe things are being thrown at you. Yeah. How do we how do we make it consumable in a time of of a physical and and emotional crisis? So absolutely, yeah. I, I, you know, you, I'm sure most people with the diagnosis remember how overwhelming it was for them. Even when you have knowledge of science or medical terms, it's still so overwhelming. Yeah. So, Melinda, I just had a quick question. So, do you yeah. have outcomes data that you track for these patients? I mean, you mentioned a couple of people um, on your slide, but do you have a global, um, you know, uh, outcomes data? I mean, PHI masked, I mean, to make it, you know, the information more accessible to these patients, you know, some of them, like you said, even if they come from a science background, to, to know what has been done in the field, you know, what is happening, what has helped people? I mean, do you maintain a global... We don't. We would love to. We would love to, um, you know, start figuring out how to gather those metrics. Mostly we just gathered, um, I, I mean, we feel like it's the metrics we've gathered or the, um, the initiative that we've done has made a difference because we're seeing more patients being uh, profiled earlier. We're seeing our clinical trial um, accrual rates, you know, go up and get filled rather quickly, and um, which is a good thing. But we probably don't have... We've gathered several stories, you know, from patients who have done that, um, but not probably the metrics we would like to. Um, we're a small and mighty team, but we have a, <laughs> a no, lot. I just want to um, even understand if there is any, you know, um, reason that would prevent people from doing yeah. that. Is there other logistical reasons that would prevent somebody from capturing that data? I mean, is... <laughs> I don't think so. I think we need to go get it and figure out how to get it. So, 
one of the things we're working on is trying to, to we have a patient registry that we're using and then um, you know we partnered with citizen too and I think we're going to do some uh, real world data um, analysis on on the um, the profiling and the genomic part of it to see so hopefully we'll have some answers from that coming up soon um, but yeah we, we're gathering the data now we got to put it to good use and figure out what's there for sure but please 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 everyone use that use use them share them um, that year the super bowl the the character um we call him um, Michelangelo, the little, he's the little tumor cell. Um, we, we had a contest and the patients named him and Mike, Michelangelo won. So that's what we, we named him, but he was actually featured on a Super Bowl snippet. We didn't, we didn't even know that the bear did that. And, and it was a big deal. I wish they would have shared because we could have promoted it a whole lot more, but, mm -hmm. but that was, I think that was, um, you know, a great opportunity to get the word out. Well, I think many of us will now um, help help get the word out. And I, I'm I didn't know about the new um, rebranding with the biomarkers matter. So that's super super cool. Any last questions for Melinda before we're we're almost at the top of the hour? And let me know if you can't access it from that uh, website, but you should be able to play it that way. And I, if not, I will be happy to send those links. Hi, Melinda. Um, the video is great. So I have. Pro posted it in Colin Town. Uh, uh, it's, it's so simply and nicely explained. So thank you for telling us about it. Wonderful. Thank you. And then next week, um, for those of you who are curious, um, next week our session is the evening session to try to get um, more of our global participants able to participate. And I'm looking madly on the calendar right now. Um, Sissy, uh, Sissy White, and I don't have a topic for her, so I will get together with her and figure out um, what she's going to share. And, and when I send the recording of this particular presentation, I will include that as well.